Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of our Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Amanda, and I'm coming to you live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And we are going to be having a, the next 30 minutes we'll be spending together looking at animal life cycles. Now, the way we're going to do this is I would love to invite you to participate along with us today. And if you have any observations, questions, or things that you would like to share during our program, we invite you to text us at the number that you see on the screen at 562 286-1838 so that you can share your thoughts and we can talk about them together during our program. Now, if you happen to be watching this at a later time on our YouTube channel, uh, you are also welcome to share any questions that come to your mind during our program by emailing us. And you can email us any questions at live at lbaop.org and one of our educators will be happy to respond to you. So let's go ahead and get started today. Um, right now, you'll notice I'm standing in front of one of our exhibits here at the Aquarium of the Pacific called Shark Lagoon. And we have some very cool animals in here. And I'll get off the screen so you can see them a little bit better for yourselves. <clears throat> but now as you're looking at these animals, I want you to think about what their life cycle is like. Now, when I mention the word life cycle, what is a life cycle? Think about that. A life cycle. What are the images that come to your mind? You've probably heard that word before, and maybe you've even seen a diagram. Um, what kind of shapes do you see in your diagram when you think about a life cycle? What kind of shapes come to your mind when you hear the word cycle? Hmm. Well, I often think of a bicycle, honestly. I love to ride my bike. And what are the things that make a bike go? Well, that common shape you're probably thinking of too is a circle, a wheel. The wheels help it go. And so a life cycle is an interesting sort of circle. That, and if you think about a circle, where is the beginning of a circle? Where does it start? Where does it end? It's kind of hard to tell because it's all connected. It all goes together. So we're going to be looking at those different stages of that life cycle, of that circle. And I want you to think though about what some of those stages are. And Oh. oh, someone else, thank you for sharing, was thinking about the diagram of a frog life cycle. So that's what you're thinking. And that's one of the first things that comes to my mind, too, when I think about a life cycle of an animal. So maybe we can actually just start with that. So if you've heard of frogs before and you've realized that they might look a little bit different as adults versus, um, shall we say children, as young frogs, well, let's look at this right here. So is this what you were thinking of when you said a life cycle and a frog life cycle? What kinds of things do you notice about this? Do you see any sort of, oh, pattern or progression? Where do you think would be the beginning and where do you think the end might be? What are the different stages that you're noticing? Can you think of any words to describe how this animal is moving from Maybe this stage to this stage, or this stage to this stage. If you wanted to kind of classify these different parts of the life cycle, what would you think of? What kinds of words would describe this versus this? And where do you think the beginning would be? You can even think about your own life. And what's the beginning part of your life? What is it like and how is it different from... Oh, maybe how your parents are right now. Well, I'm noticing this. I would say this seems to be, would you say, a big part of the frog or a little part of the frog? I shouldn't say a little part of. But if you're looking at it, do you think this is something that's really big? Is this like a big balloon thing that's like floating in the sky? Or is it pretty small? Yeah. Well, if you're noticing this word right here, the eggs... We usually think about eggs as being pretty small. So here's actually a close-up view of some frog eggs. Whoa, what do you notice about these eggs? How would you describe these? Well, I notice a few things about them. First of all, there seem to be a lot of them, not just one. So I'm noticing a lot of these eggs. I'm noticing their shape. It's also kind of round. Do you notice anything else other than their shape and being round? 
What about the colors that you see? How many colors do you see? And is there anything else that stands out to you? Well, the colors that I'm noticing are kind of this white around this big part and then a little bit of this black. It has this black spot that seems to be in the middle of it. And it seems to be on every single egg, except, wait a minute, this egg right here, I'm noticing it doesn't have just one spot in the middle. Do you notice this one? It has two of them. So this doesn't look very much like a frog right now. But this is just the youngest, the smallest stage of this frog. It starts off its life as an egg. But then you have growth that happens. And as you're looking at this egg, think about, imagine what it must be like for that little tiny frog growing inside the egg. So there's growth that happens inside the egg. There'll also be growth that happens outside. But now, do having two dark circles remind you of anything that might tell you about this frog? How would you know that this might be a frog inside of this instead of, oh, just a big bubble? <laughs> Can you think of any two round things that a frog might have? Hmm. Because, again, I'm noticing they all have them. And this one, it just looked like, oh, wait a minute. Nope. This one has two of them, too. So it has one big black thing here and another big black thing over here. So what part of the frog do you think that is? Because we are looking at something really cool. We're looking really close at this egg, but even in this egg that's so tiny, we can see evidence of a frog that will grow to be more familiar as it gets bigger, but I can see these two things. Does anyone have any idea what these two black things in this egg might be? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's not a yolk. So if you think about having eggs for breakfast and you crack an egg and it goes into the pan, you see this yellow part in the middle, that's the yolk. That's kind of like the sack lunch for the animals they're growing. And then you see the white part. Well, this black thing here is not a yolk. Eyeballs. Ah, somebody guessed eyeballs. And you're right. These are the eyes. We can actually see the eyes of these baby frogs inside the eggs. Now, here it's a little bit more obvious where the eyes are. They're a little bit, um, you know, placed in a place that we're more familiar with in relation to the rest of the body. But now suddenly those eyeballs don't look as big. Because if you look at this round circle, it's a pretty big part of it that is the eye. But then as they grow, those proportions start to change. So I want you to look, as we look at these different animals in their life stages, look at the proportions of them. Because they start off life with really big eyes. Can you imagine if our eyes were still that big? Like my whole head would be an eyeball and we would look very strange. So our eyes, this eye might actually kind of stay around the same size, but then the rest of the body kind of gets bigger around it. Okay, we had some questions coming in with where do frogs lay their eggs and how big are the eyes? Well, the eyeball question as far as the size is, it's actually a really good question. I don't know how best to tell you. They're just very, very small. <laughs> They're very small because basically that egg um, is pretty tiny. I wish I had an, I, I don't think we have any pictures that show you a, a scale. So we have this zoomed in picture that shows really close, but they're really, really small little eggs. Um, and those eyeballs are much bigger than the rest of it when they are still developing and growing. But those eggs are laid in safe places. Where do you think a safe place for an egg might be for a frog? If you think about where a frog lives, think about their habitat. What does a frog live on? Where does it like to hang out? Maybe we can look again at that picture that we had up just a second ago of a frog and where it might be, where it might live. A lily pad. Ah, somebody said a lily pad. Yeah, now look at this one here. This one's kind of different because I don't see a whole lot of water around this one. <clears throat> hmm. But frogs can be in the water. They can be out of the water too. <clears throat> but their eggs are usually laid um, in or near the water. And if you think about what those water sources would be, it could be a pond, it could be a marsh, or even a puddle. Um, and then as those eggs develop, they want to be in some sort of sort of protected area. So probably not just way out in the middle of the, the water, but in some sort of protected area. 
And then as they hatch, as they get bigger, think about how they change. Do you know what the next stage of the frog looks like? So it goes from these eyeballs inside this little tiny egg, and then it gets bigger. But it's not going to immediately look like its parent frog in the adult form. It's going to look different. Maybe we can go back to that life cycle picture that we were looking at, our little diagram. And we see the eggs, and it looks like these might have even been on a lily pad, like someone mentioned, maybe stuck there as they were in or near the water. And then we get those little embryos that are developing inside. Do you see those eyeballs? Yeah, so at first we saw the eyeballs, and then we start to see other parts of their body in the embryo stage. And then as they hatch out of that egg, when they finally crack out of that egg, they look different. What things do you notice that are different now in that picture? And then someone asked a really great question. How do frogs survive on both land and water? And also another question, what tools do we use to study these animals and how do they work? So those are great questions. Let's talk about that first one. Um, how do frogs survive on both land and water? Well, think about it. What are some things that we need to survive? We do not live in the water. We might go swimming every now and then, but we have to hold our breath. Why is it important that we hold our breath? Well, when, we're on, when we are on land, there's something we do every day that's very necessary for us to be able to survive. So I'm going to take a big deep breath and let it out. Yes, we were just breathing and we need to breathe the oxygen from the air because we have lungs. And so our lungs help us to breathe the oxygen when we are out here. Now, if we go swimming underwater, we have to hold our breath because if we try to breathe underwater, is that going to work really well for us? No, we're going to end up drowning because if we get water going into our lungs, we are not going to be able to survive. We will not get just the oxygen from the water. We need it from the air. So that water is going to fill our lungs and that would not be good for us. But now let's think about other animals that live underwater all the time, like a fish. Now the fish also needs oxygen to survive, but they get in it in a different way. What do fish have that allow them to breathe underwater? What allows them to pull the oxygen out of the water? So think about that, and I'll have you guys go ahead and chat. What is that key ingredient that fish have that help them to survive underwater that we don't have? Because if we had it, oh, it'd be great. You could stay in the water as long as you want, as long as you weren't getting too cold. Um, and you could just not have to worry about coming up to breathe, holding your breath, any of that. What do fish have that help them to breathe? So I'll give you a minute. Here's a picture of an adult fish to maybe remind you as you're looking at it, say, oh, what are those different parts of the fish's body and what helps it to breathe when it's in the water? Something very different than us. They don't have lungs. But then again, it makes me think about the frog. It survives in both land and water. So in their adult stage, frogs do have lungs, just like we do. And they can breathe with lungs the way that we do. So this animal here, you'll notice, is not underwater. And it is just happy and content breathing in oxygen into its lungs. But when it's in the younger stage, when those are eggs that are in the water, and those, the next stage that they get to, not breathing in lungs, what are they using? What do fish have that help them breathe? Hmm. This is a tough one for people. I'm trying to figure out what do fish have? What helps them breathe? No. Oh, somebody replied, thank you. Somebody said gills. And so, yes, this little covering that goes over the fish, you can't actually see their gills because they're on the inside of their bodies. But sometimes on the outside of a fish, you can see this little covering. It kind of would look like a little backwards C right about here, right behind their eyes and their mouth that allow them to breathe the water. So they breathe their water with gills. And so frogs are able to use both stages, survive on both land and water, because when they are younger, they have gills. Because it makes sense. They live in the water. They're growing up in the water. So they need to have those gills to help them breathe. So again, let's look back at that life cycle picture again and see what's different about them. Let's see if we can find any evidence of where their gills would be. 
So here we have this tadpole. So that's the next stage. So we have the eggs, the embryos, and then they have these crazy tadpoles that look really different than a frog. This does not look like a frog to me. What do you notice that's different about this compared to this? This is the adult version. This is what we're used to. But now as we're in this growing stage, so a life cycle consists, consists of a beginning. Something needs to kind of start you off. So the beginning part of the eggs. And then as they grow and develop, they go through all of these changes that look very different from the adult. What things do you notice that are different? Well, the gills, for one, the gills would be right here. So they have gills that actually start off when they're really young on the outside of their bodies. And there's actually an animal we have here at the aquarium that still has gills on the outside of its body. And it's a full-grown adult. And I don't know if we have any good pictures of it. Um, I might have my friend Cynthia, who's on the other side of this camera, running the computer and changing all these great pictures for us. Um, I might send her on a search and see if she can find one of these crazy animals that has gills on the outside of its body. But that's what these tadpoles look like when they're younger. When they're growing and developing, they have gills on the outside. And then they come in and allows them to swim underwater. But then they start to go through other changes and they develop lungs. And these adult frogs, they actually do have to hold their breath. They can't stay underwater forever. They have to come up and breathe. But at this stage, they don't have to come up to breathe at all. They stay in the water. But did you notice the things that I'm noticing? Look at the back end of this tadpole. What does it remind you of? Do you see any legs? It doesn't look like it has legs like these frog legs here, not all folded up like this one. But it's kind of like a big, long tail. And how would that help this animal if it's in the water? Do you think having a body shape like this growing up in the water is going to help that animal out? Hmm. How? Because, you know what, this tail looks a lot like some other animals in the water with tails. And think about how some other animals in the water with tails use those tails to help them survive in the water. It helps them to swim, yes, thank you. They also use this to move through the water. So they've got these little tiny front legs that are starting to come out, but their main way of getting around is going to be still using that tail in their watery environment. And then they start to get bigger. That tail, do you notice? It looks a little bit smaller now, not quite as wide, but they're also getting these legs here. So they have a new way of getting around as they're growing. These legs can help them move, but this is still helping them in their watery environment where they're spending a lot of their time. But then, and they call this a little froglet. So a froglet is when that tail starts to shrink and gets a little bit smaller. I think we actually have a picture of a tadpole and a froglet. So here's that tadpole with a really long tail. And then we have this little froglet Notice it still has this little tiny bit of a tail. It's, it's shrinking, it's getting smaller, but it doesn't look quite as weird and long shaped as this one. So its body shape is changing, but having this long skinny body shape is going to help it move through the water. This body shape will help it on land, but what else is really different about its body shape that will help it on land? What observations can you make about this animal here, about the froglet or even the adult frog? Well, it's definitely a thicker shape right here in the middle. Its eyes are still pretty prominent, still pretty big, but not as big as they were in relation to their body as when we were looking at the eggs. But now again, how are they going to move around? They have these little kind of skinny arms up front. They have these, these legs in the back that are kind of all folded together. Now, why would that help a frog to have these legs that are kind of folded? If you think about your legs, I mean, we have jointed legs, they can move, we have knees and ankles, but they're pretty straight for the most part. And you think about how we get around, well, we just walk. And so, I mean, it's important that our legs bend, but they're not all folded up in these crazy positions. Yes, somebody mentioned for hopping. So they have these folded up legs that are great to help them project themselves forward and bounce forward as they're hopping and moving uh, in their watery environment. And even if you look at their little feet that they have or the little toes, um, those are great for giving them more surface area to hold on 
and they can even stick to things like those lily pads we were talking about. So these are really interesting stages. We've seen them grow from a little egg to a tadpole to a froglet to a frog to an adult frog. Now, as an adult frog, they can do something that's really great. They can continue the life cycle. They can reproduce and lay more eggs. So then the cycle just starts all over again. So that's what a life cycle is. It's the birth, the growth, the development, and the reproduction. And then when this frog gets too old, it's going to eventually die. That's part of the life cycle too. But before it dies, it leaves all these eggs behind to continue on the life cycle of the frog. Now, that's an example of one animal in their life cycle. Now, someone said, um, they were asking, why do animals like frogs have complex life cycles instead of one or two stages? That's actually a good question. It might be, if you think about where they live, what's going to help that animal survive best in that habitat? And maybe if they were all just born as little tiny adult frogs, um, they wouldn't do so well. Maybe a lot of them, if they were all born with lungs, they would all end up drowning in the water. That wouldn't be good. Um, it could be that, you know, having that different body shape and that different style helps them at different stages, different seasons. Um, all to survive because maybe there's other animals that live in that area that they would have to compete with for food that they don't have to worry about because they're at a different stage and different um, things are available to them and they're able to do and utilize things that the other animals wouldn't be able to do if they were in that adult stage already. But there are some animals that have a much simpler lifestyle, like even people and mammals. So people are mammals and they have a simple life cycle where they kind of grow. We really need our parents to help us watch over us and take care of us and help us as we develop and grow. But we look pretty similar. Our body change doesn't change that much. A little baby is a lot smaller and some of the proportions change. Um, but then as an adult, there's some definite similarities that we see. So it's not as complicated as this um, kind of simple yet complex animal. But then there's another animal that lives in the ocean that has a very interesting complex life cycle. And it's an animal that has no bones. And it floats around very gently. And it just seems to be very calm as it moves through. Oh, and then another question, as you're thinking about this animal that lives in the ocean that just kind of floats through without any bones, um, another question was, what tools do we use to study these animals and how do they work? Those are really great, great questions because if you think about when we were looking at those eggs, what tool do you think we were using when we were looking at those eggs and we were looking at those close-up eyes? What tools can you use to make something that's really small look a little bit bigger? Can you think of what kind of tools you would use to get a really good look at this animal here? Because right now it looks like it's the same size as my head, or actually bigger than my head, but that's not really to scale. We're using something that makes it look much, much bigger. What is it? What do you use that makes something really small look a lot bigger so that you can see it better? Hmm. I bet some of you are answering right now. We'll see, Jen, who gets the first response. Because there is a few responses. There's a few different things that uh, you could use to make something small look big. Now, we also have tools that make something far away look really close. That would be a telescope. When something's really far away, we can get a closer look at it by making it seem closer. Ah, oh, good. Somebody mentioned a magnifying glass. That is one of the easiest, simplest tools to use. All you have to do is hold it on up, look right through it, and it makes something small look a lot bigger. And it gives us the ability to see details that we wouldn't normally see. There's also another instrument that we can use. It's kind of like a magnifying glass, but even more powerful and even stronger. You can look through this and see something super tiny that maybe you couldn't even see if you took it away. Like, you're like, there's nothing there. And then you look through this thing and it makes that small thing look really big. Scientists use them a lot. And it kind of has a name like a telescope, but instead of looking at something really far away, instead of being a telescope, it's another scope when you're looking at something really, really tiny. Does anyone know what I'm thinking of? Hmm, what instrument makes something really small look really big? Well, tiny things 
we call microscopic. So microscopic things are small things. And so if we want to look at small things, scope them out, we would use a microscope. So microscopes are great tools for um, watching things develop that are really, really tiny. But magnifying glasses are really all you need for watching um, a frog grow. Now think about as they get bigger. And if you're wanting to learn more about them, maybe you even sit somewhere and you use binoculars. Maybe you want to sit on the side of the... Of, of a hill going down by a pond and you might use your binoculars to watch that frog as it's moving around or getting a closer look at those tadpoles as they're swimming. Of course, tools you might need, maybe some boots if you want to walk around the water and get even closer. So there's lots of great tools for using um, to look at these animals. And of course, how do we get this picture? We used a camera. So taking cameras, taking videos, and watching and observing animals are ways that you can document and look at different stages. You could go every day and mark down um, what day it is, what time it is, and how those things look, and see how long it takes them to progress through those different changes um, and those stages. So great question. Now, again, that animal I was thinking about that floats, what animal is that? They have a crazy life cycle. This floating animal I was thinking of as a sea jelly. And the sea jellies have something really unique and special about them, is they have two very important different stages of their life. What you're looking at here is what we call a medusa stage. It's the adult stage of the jelly. And it has what we call a bell. That's the bell, that round shape of their body. But then as they are adults floating around, remember, they're not going to live very long. Actually, jellies live maybe only a few months sometimes. So they have a very short life cycle, but they produce eggs too. And so when those eggs meet together and get fertilized in the water, they become little larvae. And then you can't really see it very well up at the top here, but they have these little tiny eggs in the water. And as they grow and develop into larvae, then they settle down. They attach onto something like maybe a rock and then they start to grow. Like what you're seeing here, this kind of solid thing, this kind of weird shape in the background would represent something solid like a rock that they're holding onto. And then they start to grow outward from there. Almost like, it kind of looks like a sea anemone. Have you heard of sea anemones or seen them before? Where Nemo lives, where they come up like this and they look like they have little tentacles coming out of them. Well, what you're looking at here is a polyp. A polyp stage is kind of like, it looks like a little sea anemone, but these are actually baby jellies. Baby jellies have this polyp stage where they grow up attached to something like a rock, and then they reach up with all these tentacles that are sticking out just like anemones have, and just like the adult medusa stage of a sea jelly has. But the adult stage, the medusa tentacles hang down. So the jellies float through the water with these long tentacles hanging down as adults. But when they start off life, they're really, really tiny, like between my fingernails tiny. But then they have these tentacles that reach up and grow like this in that polyp stage. And then something really crazy happens. As they're starting to grow like this, they start to get a little bit longer. And then if you notice right here, if you're looking really, really carefully, you'll notice it looks like it's got these little sections to it. And then one by one, this is actually what we call a strobila or strobila. They go through this process called strobilation, which sounds really crazy, but it's like one by one, it starts to break up into these little pieces and these little jelly babies come off of it. And so one little polyp can create several little individual babies and they pop off looking like this. We call these ephyra. And these are little baby jellies and they pull through the water like this. Notice they don't have that smooth circular like one long line of a circle like the adult medusa have. They have these little kind of, looks like little fingers kind of sticking out from around them. And this will eventually grow all together into one nice circle and look like the jellies that we're all familiar with, the sea jellies floating through the water in their adult stage. So isn't it interesting that something as simple as a jelly, which might only live for three months, has this really interesting life cycle that it goes through. So the ocean is full of so many different kinds of animals and so many different kinds of life cycles. We started off looking at our sharks in Shark Lagoon, and some sharks are born in similar ways to people. They give live birth. Some sharks just have baby sharks come out of them. They look just like 
the adult's just a smaller version. And then you know what that shark does? It just swims off on its own and takes care of itself for the rest of its life. It doesn't need any care from mom. But then we have other sharks that lay eggs, kind of like birds, but they look a little bit different, like our bamboo sharks here. They lay eggs, and you've probably even heard of them before. There's a special name we call shark eggs. We refer to them as mermaid's purses sometimes. And inside that egg, we have that yolk sac. Remember when we were talking about cracking open a chicken egg uh, for breakfast and you see that yellow sac in the middle? Well, that's the yolk. And that's what the yolk sac is right here in this shark. That's what we're looking, or in the shark egg. We can see that shadow, the silhouette of the yolk sac, which is basically the sac lunch for that shark as it's growing inside the egg. So here you can actually see this little teeny tiny baby shark and it's going to get bigger and bigger and then eventually swim out that egg case. So we have fish that live in the ocean that develop from little tiny eggs, kind of like that frog, but then start to change colors and get bigger and their shape changes a little bit as they turn into adult fish. We've got um, jellies that have these polyp stages and then they break off into these little tiny fire that eventually will turn into the big adult medusa. And then we have animals like even baby seals that are born that are very similar looking to the adults, but they need extra care from mom as they're growing. But so many different kinds of animals, so many interesting life stages. I'd encourage you to think about one of your favorite animals and learn about the life stage and the life cycle that they go through. So from little tiny embryo to um, adult and anywhere in between, it's kind of fun to watch animals. I love to look at animals and how they grow. And it's fun to come to the aquarium and see some of our animals that might start off as little tiny fish eggs eventually grow to be these really big fish. Um, and maybe as we leave, we'll end with our giant sea bass that you can see in our blue cavern exhibit because we have some giant sea bass which are really big fish here at the aquarium. And a few years ago, they laid some eggs. And they had, we had a little tiny baby, like this big, little tiny egg that developed into a little baby giant sea bass. Now we can't see the baby giant sea bass in this particular um, view that we have of our webcam, but you can um, see the animals, the adults that they will grow into. So we'll leave you with that as we, we head off and say goodbye for the day. But thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed learning about the life cycles of some different animals. And I hope that as you look at animals, you'll think a little bit about what it was like when they were little. What did it look like? How many stages, how many changes did they go through, I wonder? Well, here's a, here are those giant sea bass I was talking about. It's hard to believe that something as big as these giant sea bass can start off as so small, these little tiny eggs. But have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.